worst rapper alive. Oops. Yeah, yeah. Big Mac's back on the mic like oops. Back on the horse, still jumping through hoops. I'm missing Lincoln Pink, I don't lip sync. Just to be clear, choking isn't my kink, but I do it anyway sometimes, I guess. Gotta laugh now, die later in my times of stress. I'm blessed, feeling good, charged up like a Hadouken. Welcome into a short edition of the worst wrestling podcast. I am your host with the least, Jack Lucine. Today we are doing a short review of ECW One Night Stand from 2005, the inaugural uh, out of the Hammerstein Ballroom in Manhattan, New York City. Uh, Shout out to my boy Pistol Peter Weslick. Uh, Pete and I went to college together. He made this request uh, to me uh, via Facebook. If you guys out there want to make requests uh, for shows, fan questions, uh, show topics, that kind of thing. You can send it to any of my socials at Jack Lusme on Twitter, Facebook, uh, TikTok, even, or you can send emails to worst sports channel at gmail.com. So we'll get right into the show review. Uh, starting off with multiple parental warnings. Fuck yeah. Uh, very you know, um, nostalgic, uh, reminiscent of my younger uh, wrestling fandom days. And this was honestly one of the hottest crowds uh, that I can ever remember. Uh, ECW crowds in general were always unhinged, but the the first one night stand, um, a lot of them thought that it was going to be just a one-off. And so... People really showed out for it, and man, the crowd was so ridiculous the whole night. Uh, we start off with Joey Styles coming out, uh, just chock full of emotion. Oh my god! Delivering the promo, um, and then what I thought was really cool was they had Mick Foley uh, come out uh, as like Cactus in the Cactus Jack uh, gear and music. Uh, and he basically got to participate as an announcer for the show. So we had the combination of Joey Styles and Mick Foley. Um, and again, it's just a lot of the ECW originals. There were a lot of highlights on this show. Uh, there was even uh, an in memoriam segment uh, for fallen ECW stars of the past. Really, just honestly. One of my favorite pay-per-views of all time. I think very underrated. Uh, the first uh, ECW One Night Stand. And it's funny because, you know, and I'm like many fans. I I feel like I sometimes get it mixed up a little bit. Uh, the one from 2006, the year after this, when RVD won the title from John Cena. Uh, but that was actually the second One Night Stand, which maybe I'll do a review of at some point in the future. Uh, But we start off with the classic ECW showrunner and music. Um, And this was at a time, especially, you know, when WWE embraced counterculture acts uh, like Austin and The Rock and DX. You know, ECW was true counterculture. Uh, They were the innovators of violence. Um, I didn't watch a lot of other wrestling when I was young. For me, it was primarily WWF. But. I will say I definitely got, I went out of my way to get my hands on some ECW tapes uh, because, you know, you would hear about, oh, it's so, it's hardcore and it's like basically only hardcore matches. And so uh, I grew up loving ECW and when they did get bought out by WWF, I had higher hopes for what it ultimately became. I think we all did. Uh, but. Uh, that first ECW one night stand, like I mentioned before, really was supposed to be a one-off. Um, and I think it really set the tone for the entire night. And so uh, we start with the first match, Lance Storm, uh, who came out with Don Marie versus Lionheart Chris Jericho. So a throwback to his very younger days. Uh, this was honestly... Probably one of the better actual wrestling matches on the card. 
And, uh, you know, we had the tie-ins of how Jericho and Lance Storm broke into wrestling together and how they had their first match against each other in Alberta, Canada in front of like 100 people. You had Joey Styles mentioning that on commentary. It was a fantastic match, very technical. Fans were super into it. And Lance Storm, uh, I think, is one of the most underappreciated uh, and physically talented in-ring workers. Obviously, you know, his... His uh, shtick was, you know, he was stiff as a corpse when it came to, like, promo work and uh, the entertainment aspect of it. But, you know, I really – and it's funny because even in this um, environment, I got confused because the crowd was literally chanting, fuck John Cena. But it was just because of what he represented it at that time, even uh, you know, foreshadowing what would come the next year. But even at that time – representing basically everything uh, about the WWE machine that ECW fans hated. Uh, so you had Lance Storm going over. Uh, Don Marie interrupts. Uh, the ref missed uh, Lance Storm tapping out, and that's when Just Incredible came out and nailed Jericho with a kendo shot, uh, giving Lance Storm the pin and the win. Uh, and then this was... Uh, you know, I, I did ratings. We'll just say I rated this an A. Uh, and then next up, we had the Pitbull Gary Wolf. Uh, this was the In Memoriam segment. Uh, introduces ECW. Um, it was a, the segment was called ECW Remembers, uh, and it was for the fall in ECW Remember. So you had Rocco Brock, Terry Gordy, uh, Mike Lockwood, a.k.a. Crash Holly, uh, the original Sheik. Mike Lazansky, uh, Pitbull Anthony Durante, and Big Dick Dudley, sorry, Big Dick Dudley, and Chris Candido. So, you know, rest in peace uh, and shout out to the families of all of those wrestlers. Uh, next, we had Tajiri, who came out uh, with Mikey Whipwreck and Sinister Minister, uh, dressed like a modern day Solo Sokoa. And we had. Um, it was this was a weird match. It was so it was <laughs> Tajiri versus Little Guido, Little Guido, aka Nunzio, uh, with the full blooded Italians in his faction, uh, accompanying him to the ring, and then versus Super Crazy. And this was a triple threat elimination match, so an international three way dance. Super Crazy. So underrated. And what they did to him in Psychosis, uh, and I forget the other guy, I think it was Hooventude, when they came uh, to WWE and they put them all on a fucking lawnmower. Criminal. Criminal what they did to these guys. Because, man, super crazy is an in-ring worker. Fucking so good and so underrated. Go back and watch some of his matches. Um, but, yeah, great match, honestly. Uh, you had super crazy with a fucking moonsault off the second balcony. Uh, hitting it on the on the FBI. Uh, you had Big Guido goes for a power bomb on Tajiri with uh, Nunzio on the top rope, uh, but Tajiri counters and hits the mist. Uh, and then Mikey Whipwreck hits the whippersnapper, and then Tajiri was able to pin Nunzio. Um, and then Tajiri and Super Crazy continue in a one on one for a while until Super Crazy wins with a power bomb and moonsault. Uh, and again, for me, this segment was an A. And then we got uh, early ECW memories video package. So uh, this was uh, just, uh, you know, a lot of the highlights of ECW. And my favorite uh, is this uh, this promo that Sam is giving. And he says, life's a bitch. And then you marry one. I thought that was fucking hysterical. It's just so uh, indicative of, again, ECW trying to push the boundaries back in the day and what made them so fucking good. Uh, but, yeah, um, they had, like, m the moment when they filled the ring with the chairs or, like, when the fans uh, all rushed the ring with Public Enemy and they broke the ring. So, like, all these historical ECW moments, they were showing those. And then we get uh, the Extreme Lucha Libre match uh, between Psychosis and Rey Mysterio. Uh, and this, again, had a lot of history behind it. I think that was like, that was also something that I really enjoyed about uh, the card was even though it was put together as a one-off. And this is actually something AEW could uh, learn from 
and maybe implement even more uh, in their own storytelling. And they do do it sometimes, but uh, it feels like it, they kind of do it too much as one-offs. But anyways, um, the history behind a lot of the wrestlers, so Psychosis and Rey Mysterio both uh, trained with uh, Rey Mysterio's father. And uh, they had had like over a hundred matches, uh, you know, throughout like Mexico and ECW and all that. So um, you really had psychosis kind of going with a little different of a strategy, kind of slowing the match down. It did start to pick up once he hit a guillotine leg drop uh, to Ray on the barrier. And then Ray hit a sent uh, senton from the top rope to outside in the crowd, which was crazy. Uh, Ray, would eventually hit a 619 and a West Coast, uh, West Coast pop for the win. There definitely were some moments. Uh, there were great high spots. The This was a match where the crowd was definitely less into it compared to other matches. Uh, there were a couple botches also. It felt like um, psychosis also, or not botches necessarily, but just kind of moments that didn't quite click as clean between psychosis and Ray and psychosis is really going with a more traditional ground and pound style, I think was the wrong choice just for this specific crowd. Honestly, I think if they just did like eight minutes of just like do your craziest shit and blow it up and blow it out crowd would have been going fucking nuts. Um, but you know, it dragged a little bit, but I still had this as a B plus, uh, and this was the worst match on the card, uh, in my opinion. And so it just tells you how fucking, how fucking much I love this pay-per-view. Um, at this point, we get this great moment where all the WWE guys come from uh, SmackDown. Uh, you had Kurt Angle and JBL leading the way. You get more ECW highlights, memories, uh, including Stone Cold uh, cutting promos against Eric Bischoff. Uh, we get the quintessential stud muffin, Joel Gertner, uh, who is just this hilarious. He's like their uh, version of um, like uh, Jonathan Coachman, who we also saw on this show, uh, funny enough. And then uh, Rob Van Dam uh, comes out uh, in a knee brace. And he, you know, he's accompanied by Fonzie. And this was one of Rob's best promos i think that he ever delivered at least in wwf uh, and i would say arguably maybe the best promo of his career because honestly this was just so heartfelt um about him putting the show together and unfortunately not being able to be on the show because of the injury to me one night stand one and two was the best work of rob van dam's WWF career specifically. So obviously I'm always going to think of Rob as what he did in ECW. And honestly, even I feel like he's done uh, more since leaving WWF uh, that you could uh, account for. Um, but real specifically, like in the WWF, I feel like that run of the one night stands, the first one and then winning the title from John Cena at the second one, to me, that is always going to be the highlight of Rob Van Dam's WWF career. Uh, but then he gets uh, attacked by Rhino, and the lights go out, and we get the homicidal, the genocidal, Sabu, and Sabu versus Rhino. Uh, sorry, suicidal, homicidal, genocidal. Oh, yeah. And then uh, this was just a fucking classic ECW match. Uh, Tears, Air Sabu, Gore to the ref, RVD up one good leg, getting involved, hitting a drop kick with the chair. Uh, Sabu hitting uh, the Arabian Skull Crusher for the win. To me, this was just, this was uh, ECW embodied in a match. Uh, so B plus for me. And then again, you get Al Snow and Head, you get more ECW highlights, you get Raw entering the building with Eric Bischoff and Edge and Christian and Jonathan Coachman. Uh, and then this, uh, and then you get a match. Um, honestly, it was, uh, so it was Chris Benoit versus Eddie Guerrero. Rest in peace to both of them. This wasn't their best match, but the two of them are just incapable of having a bad match. Uh, so this was just, again, a solid B plus 
Um, and then we're just going to keep it moving, keep it grooving. We got Stud Muffin gets uh, back on the screen, getting bullied by Raw. And then uh, shout out to my guy, uh, Peter, because uh, he really said specifically that he wanted me to focus on this upcoming match. It was his favorite on the card. Unfortunately, I kind of slightly disagree with him. You know, hey, wrestling fans are allowed to have different opinions, but Mike Awesome versus Osaka Tanaka. <laughs> Mike Awesome damn near kills Tanaka like multiple times in this match. Uh, almost kills him with an errant power bomb from the apron to the mat through the uh, through the table. Uh, this match was unprotected chair shots galore. Tornado DDT from Tanaka uh, to Awesome on a chair. Uh, concerto fucking... At one point, hits a double chair elbow drop. Uh, this was a brutal match, honestly. Uh, there was another DDT spot through the table. Uh, and then counters with the awesome bomb. Uh, Mike Awesome does through an already broken table. It was really funny because at one point, JBL started rooting for Mike Awesome. And it felt like he was rooting for his ECW counterpart. Because I think that's why it's like he identified with Mike Awesome. Uh, but then another awesome bomb and a splash through a table outside uh, finally ends this match. Tanaka, one tough motherfucker. I will give him that. Uh, for me, this was, again, a B plus. I don't think I had, I didn't have anything less than a B plus on the card. Probably a little bit emotional. Uh, but if I had, I said earlier that, Arguably the worst match was Ray and Psychosis, and I would still agree with that. But on a technical level, this one was close because fucking Tanaka, like I said, just looked like he was straight up getting killed out there. So I felt kind of bad for him. But great match nonetheless. And then we get Paul Heyman comes out. And, you know, just as usual, Paul Heyman, uh, a mensch on the mic, but he delivers an incredible promo in his classic ECW Paul Heyman manner. Uh, and then we get the main event of the evening, Dudley's, the Dudley Boys, versus Tommy Dreamer and Sandman. And people talk about what is the greatest entrance in wrestling history. This is the greatest entrance in wrestling history. Sandman coming through the crowd, the entire crowd losing their fucking minds. He's he's pouring beer. Fans are drinking it. He's popping himself with the beer can. He's busted open before the match. He gets down ringside uh, with uh, Tommy Dreamer. And they're fucking pouring shots into women's cleavage and drinking up the beer. Like, this is just classic, unhinged 90s. Fucking ECW uh, programming, and the the entrance itself like lasts like fucking honestly like three to five minutes long, and it is worth every fucking. Th the audience is just one hundred percent invested, and then the match is just a complete cl cluster fuck and just hilarious. Um, you at one point you get um, Blue World Order. Uh, comes out and attacks uh, Sandman Dreamer and Dreamer. Uh, you get fucking uh, Axel Rotten and Balls Mahoney come out to make the save with Kid Cash. Uh, you get Kid does this great spot though. Kid Cash did this great spot where he did a, a jumping somersault flip from the inside of the ring to the outside uh, on on a bunch of people and just kind of clears clears a bunch of all these interference people away. And then you just get the rest of the match. And at one point, they're pulling out fucking cheese graters and shit. And then more interruptions. Uh, Lance Storm and Justin Credible come out all of a sudden. Uh, then you get Beulah McGillicuddy uh, comes down uh, to take out Don Marie. And then Beulah and Tommy hit double DDTs. Everybody has a crimson mask at this point. Everybody's fucking bleeding. Tommy's bleeding. Sam is bleeding. Both the Dudley boys are bleeding. Everybody's fucking bleeding. 3D, more tables. Spike Dudley fucking comes out of nowhere. Uh, they give him lighter fluid and they do the flaming table spot to Tommy Dreamer and the Dudleys pick up the win. And just when you think it can't get any better, Sandman after the match, he's in the ring. All the ECW alum are coming down to the ring to celebrate. 
and Sandman's screaming, I need a beer! I need a beer! And then, what do you hear? Stone Cold! Stone Cold! And it's a Pavlovian response. Everybody loses their fucking minds at this point. Austin and Sandman, they're drink, uh, they're fucking, uh, sorry, they are like about to drink together, but then Austin's like, hey, all you fucking WWE motherfuckers up there, why don't you come down here and fight us? And we get this huge ECW versus WWE brawl. Uh, of course, ECW stands tall. And then there's this great moment, too, where Austin, uh, you see Eric Bischoff trying to slink on out of the arena. And uh, Stone Cold says, ah, 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 where are you going, Eric? And he tells Mick Foley to grab him and bring him down to the ring. And then uh, credit to Eric Bischoff uh, go, uh, gets dragged to the ring, takes a 3D from the, uh, the Dudleys. Then he takes a flying headbutt from Benoit. He takes a 619 from Ray. And then... Uh, Stone Cold holds the mic to Bischoff's face, and uh, Bischoff, in his final words, says, Fuck ECW. And Austin picks him up, hits him with the stunner, drinks beer with Stanman. They're smashing beers together, and the show closes. A perfect reunion show to me. This was an A plus segment ending match, whatever the fuck you want to call it. The whole show was one of my favorites. We're dragging a little long on the short episode. But, man, I just love this pay-per-view, pay-per-view so goddamn much. Uh, so until the next time, I will catch all of you guys on the flip side. A positive contact results in affirmative impact. Never pull the rats on raps. I'm never primitive, but animalistic, vicious. Characteristics, hereditary potency, epicetic genes, yo. Ever the HMCs at extraordinary speed. Some of the is like, some of the rings of blitz and grease in your bare feet. I see your fucking colleagues misprize you very much to your dismay. So today, I can say you won't be running away. Hold your tail between your legs. I'm gonna advocate when you fail with low stakes. I'll take